Cool. Well, good morning. Uh, good to be sharing God's Word with you today. As you may or may not know, um, this is our vision series where we are uh, journeying over five weeks in one chapter, which, I mean, when they uh, first started sharing this, I thought, okay, how are we going to use one chapter over five weeks? But there's just such rich content in John chapter 4, which is the center of the vision that we have for this year. And the vision of the church is to bring hope, salvation, and now we're entering a phase of mobilizing. That we have what we have received uh, in the hope and salvation that we have through Jesus is not just for ourselves. And so um, we discovering how we are part of God's mission in uh, bringing hope and salvation to the community around us. Uh, as we go through each of these weeks, we'll also be uh, reading from John chapter 4, um, and so to keep it interesting and uh, feeling like you um, have something to focus on this morning, uh, the topic this morning is looking at how we are called to invest in meaningful relationships. And so as um, I read through John chapter 4 this morning, uh, it's a narrative, it's a story, it's a, re a record account of an interaction that Jesus had with um, a Samaritan woman. Uh, would you be focusing your mind on the words of the text, but also thinking, uh, how does this relate to uh, the idea of investing? How did Jesus invest here? And then we'll unpack that a little bit more together. Uh, sound okay? Cool. Okay, well, you're here anyway, so... Um, I hope it sounds okay. Okay, so uh, John chapter 4, I'll re be reading from the message version just because I think it tells, uh, captures the essence of uh, this narrative really well. Here we go. Jesus realized that the Pharisees were keeping count of the baptisms that he and John performed, although his disciples, not Jesus, did the actual baptizing. They had posted the score that Jesus was ahead, turning him and John into rivals in the eyes of the people. So Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. To get there, he had to pass through Samaria. He came to Sychar, a Samaritan village that bordered the field Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. It was noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? His disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh living water. The woman said, sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with, and this well is deep. So how are you going to get this living water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it, and his sons and livestock, and passed it down to us? Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I will give will never thirst, not ever. The water I will give will be a spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so that I won't ever get thirsty, won't ever have to come back to this well again. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and then come back. I have no husband, she said. That's nicely put, I have no husband. You've had five husbands and the man you're living with now isn't even your husband. You spoke the truth there, sure enough. Oh, so you're a prophet. Well, then tell me this. Our ancestors worshipped God at this mountain, but you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place for worship, right? Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. 
we Jews worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. But the time is coming. In fact, it has come when what you're called will not matter and where you go to worship will not matter. It's you who are and the way that you live that count before God. You, your worship must engage your spirit in pursuit of the truth. That's the kind of people that the Father is looking for. Those who are simple, simply and honestly themselves before Him in their worship. God is sheer bringing it, being itself, spirit. Those who worship Him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. The woman said, I don't know about that. I do know that the Messiah is coming. When he arrives, we'll get the whole story. I am he, said Jesus. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked. They couldn't believe that he was talking with that kind of a woman. No one said what they were all thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hints and left. In her confusion, she left her water pot. Back in the village, she told the people, come and see a man who knew all things, all about the things I did, who knows me inside and out. Do you think this could be the Messiah? And they went to see for themselves. We, we setting with a story of this remarkable encounter that Jesus has with a woman. It's stunning for the disciples, it's stunning for her, and it's stunning for us to read as we begin to explore this passage. This isn't just a casual meeting. This is Jesus demonstrating that he is breaking through barriers and forging deep connections. Back in Jesus' time, Jews and Samaritans kept their, different, uh, their distance entangled in a web of historical and cultural tensions. But Jesus wasn't one to adhere to these boundaries. He crossed these lines with purpose and intention, choosing to engage with someone whom society had pushed to the margins. As I said today, uh, last week we looked at how Jesus connected with the woman and actually broached that step and had some sort of engagement. But today we're going to look a little bit deeper at the power and importance of investing in genuine relationships. Jesus shows us what it means to truly see, understand, and deeply invest in others, even those who are often overlooked or undervalued. Now, this is a story about a woman at a well, and my thinking for this message started with thinking, well, I wonder if there's any parallel between what it takes to dig a well and uh, see what it means to invest in others. And I think uh, there's a few similarities that could come into our mind. One thing for starters is that when it comes to digging a well, well, wells rely on water that is deep within the ground, right? And so when you look at the ground, you aren't seeing the water that you are going in after. Investment requires us to look beyond the surface. Okay, now if you had to look at the person sitting you, next to you. You can look at them, but maybe you don't want to. But um, if, you, if you think about the person sitting next to you, you think that, oh, well, I've got a pretty good sense of where this person is at, right? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, Alex thinks he does. Um, good. But, but in reality, until we've got to know someone, until we've made some sort of investment in someone, you often don't really know. I know that there's many sitting here this morning, um, and myself would be included in that, who have a lot within us, uh, a lot deep down, that is good and bad and ugly and beautiful, all sort of wrapped into one, and we can't see that just from a surface-level interaction. 
You might be able to see the person sitting next to you, but you don't necessarily know how they're feeling today, uh, if you're finding them in a good place or in a bad place, uh, facing a challenge. Um, and it really takes some sort of interaction that, um, that gets us to see and understand beyond the surface. What we're seeing is somewhat just the tip of the iceberg, and we don't get to the heart of what someone is experiencing until we take time to engage with them beyond casual greetings or superficial conversations. Jesus, in his interaction with the woman at the well, gives us a profound example of this engagement. He doesn't just see a Samaritan woman or abide by the cultural norms of her um, being ignored. He sees her. He seeks to understand her. He engages with her on a level that cuts through the external labels and reaches into the depths of her being. Now remember, Jesus and his disciples are taking a long trip from Judea to Galilee and decide in the heat of the day, noontime, to stop and rest. His disciples go into town to get some food, and Jesus rests by the well, and he's not there too long when this woman approaches the well to draw water. Listen again to the interaction that John records for us. He says, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews, uh, what, uh, for Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Now, we may focus on this passage a lot, and through the series, we're really going in. But I want to remind us that this isn't the first odd interaction that Jesus has had with someone. If you go back to read John chapter 3, you'll hear about another kind of person that Jesus interacts with, a religious man, a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. And him and Jesus also have a really puzzling interaction about what it means to be born again. But now, if you had to compare the woman at the well to the um, religious man Nicodemus, you would understand that Jesus was really into engaging with just about everyone. They were really somewhat two people in very opposite situations, one very moral and righteous and upright, and another who was not as moral and righteous and upright, people who are very different, a man and a woman, uh, people from different nationalities, a Jew and a Samaritan, but people with one very same thing in common. They both desperately need the same thing, Jesus. Everyone, everywhere needs Jesus. Rich or poor, religious or secular, left-wing or right-wing, African, Asian, American, European. Everyone, everywhere needs Jesus. And just by that virtue, it means that we are called to look at the people around us, the people placed around us, and realize that we have some sort of calling to interact and engage with them, even to invest in them, because they are looking for Jesus. Like I said, the one was, from a surface level, looking moral and upright. Another one from a surface level and looking not so. But Jesus chose to engage with them. Jesus had every reason not to interact with the woman. But just as he did with Nicodemus, he begins a conversation that penetrates to the root of the issue. Jesus understands her heart. Jesus understands her condition even when she doesn't. Jesus reached out to the moral Pharisee and the immoral Samaritan. Both of them were in desperate need for salvation from sin. A salvation that can only come from Jesus because everyone everywhere needs Jesus. 
Jesus saw and understood beyond the surface as he interacted with people. He invested them for the potential that they carried simply because they are people made in God's image. And as he interacts, it goes deeper. He takes the conversation to the next level. He opens up this uh, realm of vulnerability and touches their lives and their hearts. I believe that we are also called to not just have these surface-level interactions with people around us. You don't know what the people around you necessarily are going through. And so it's our calling to build genuine relationships, which take time. They cost something. But still, we go and press beyond the surface. Maybe that's just through the asking of good intentional questions. One of the funny things as I've grown to work with Jason, who many of you know as a pastor here, is often, I mean, I can get like really crazy and stressed and busy and complicated. And a question that he frequently asks me is, how do I find you today? Like, where are you at? What are you going through? Where's your mind? And that's just a nice point of engagement. And now I do that with other people that I work alongside or that I'm friends with, to just make that intentional, deliberate action of trying to start seeing beyond the surface. Of course, seeing beyond the surface requires relationship and trust to be built, for people to feel like they've been heard and listened to. But we invest nevertheless. Okay, so just like drilling a well in the ground requires you to look at the ground and say, I believe that there's water somewhere in this ground. I'm going to start digging. So investment means that we look at people on the surface and we don't know what they're going through, but still we take the time and energy and make that investment to start getting to know them and build relationship. Okay? Cool. We'll see if the well analogy falls apart. Um, next, investment requires us to lay aside our agendas. Remember how Jesus starts this sort of interaction. It starts with the woman walking up to the well. She's got the goods, okay? She's got the bucket. She's got the rope. She comes to this well, and she knows how to go about getting water out of it, but... Jesus says, uh, Jesus, and Jesus asks her for a drink. That's how the interaction starts, but that's not how the interaction continues, okay? In the end, it ends with the woman receiving something, okay? Jesus giving this living water or speaking about this living water. Jesus' priority and agenda wasn't about what he could get, but what he could give, the water was this point of common, common um, interaction. It served as a foundation for this connection, which Jesse spoke about last week. He said to us, remember, like, lots of us need lots of things. Few of us will realize that, I mean, water is the one thing that we all need. It's sort of this commonality. Jesus engages with her, and it goes beyond this idea of physical thirst. Jesus didn't have any ulterior motives. It was pure in that he wanted to form a genuine connection. And by engaging with her, Jesus demonstrated an attentiveness to her story, her identity, her needs. Jesus does a lot more listening at the start than he does speaking. He asks her questions. He wants to understand how she considers the condition of her heart before he reveals that he knows. He wants her to hear what she thinks about the Messiah before he reveals himself as the Messiah. Jesus' investment in the conversation wasn't calculated based on what the return might be. It was an investment made out of love, compassion, and genuine interest in the well-being of the person before him. When we start digging a well into this piece of ground, sometimes you need to keep on going. 
I was doing a little bit of research on wells because I'm relying on it pretty heavily for the sermon. And I, I, I learned that some wells, sometimes you can hit ground at 10 meters, okay? Sometimes, uh, sometimes you hit uh, water, I mean, at 10 meters. Sometimes you hit water at 30 meters. Sometimes you hit water at 300 meters down. It's a different situation, and you don't really know what it's going to be that you're going to need to invest to get to the water. But still we keep on going. Still we keep on making the sacrifices, because that's an act of grace. Sometimes when you start building a relationship with someone, you don't know where it's going to head. And that might just instinctively, maybe it's by your personality or from past hurts or experience, make you turn off and say, I'm not, I'm not investing here if I don't know that it's going to yield well on my, like, I'm not going to get a return. Like, that doesn't really make sense. But if every person everywhere needs Jesus, we can't really be selective in how we share the gospel. There's not some of your friends who need Jesus and some that don't. They all do. There's not some people that you work with that need to hear about Jesus and some that don't. They all do. There's not some members of your family that need to hear about Jesus and some that don't. We're all sinful people in need of a Savior in the person of Jesus Christ. And so whether it looks like it's going to be a great prospect or the prospects are looking dim, we go for it. We never know what a relationship is going to yield. Maybe you see fruit right now, and maybe you see fruit in South Africa now now, okay? Maybe you see things like long in the future, or maybe you see an immediate return. That requires you, if you're going to invest in people around you, you're going to have to lay your agenda aside because you don't know the road ahead. Everyone is thirsty for something. And people go to all sorts of lengths to try and unpack how they can quench their thirst. Listen to what King Solomon said about his attempt to quench his thirst in the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, all that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. I went for it. I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all of my struggles. This was my reward for all my struggles. When I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything to be futile and the pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. When, we, when people are searching for the wrong thing, they just give over to whatever, whatever earthly, worldly, fleshly desire that they have. But just like Nicodemus and just like the woman at the well, thirsty for something, looking for the one who can satisfy. Because of our sin, each one of us is thirsting for something, some experience, some person, some position that will satisfy. But everything will leave us empty and longing for more. You could look at this woman and say, She's had five husbands, and now she's got a boyfriend that she's living with. Like, the chances of this lady becoming a great influence in her community is not great. And so maybe, maybe someone else is, is better worth my time, but that's not Je what Jesus models for us. Jesus invests anyway. Jesus shows us that investing in people is an act of grace, no one is too far gone. No one is out of reach. We should have no agenda, and it's not for us to judge whether the soil of someone's heart and life is ready to receive the good news. And someone extended that act of grace to you. Someone saw something in you that chose them to invest in you even when the prospects probably didn't look that great. When the prospects didn't look too great for the world, Jesus invested in us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us and made the greatest investment of all.
For those that God has placed in front of us, we should invest without an agenda. It might take a ton of time and energy, and all be for nothing in the end, but how are we to really ever know? We to be faithful stewards of the opportunities and open doors that God has set before us. Okay, so sometimes we're looking at the ground and we have to lay our agenda aside as we keep on digging the well. Last point. Investment leads to harvest beyond our expectations. So Jesus has this encounter. He goes for it. He uh, reveals himself. He speaks to the woman, hears where she's at, understands her heart, offers her this living water that can uh, quench her thirst forever and ever. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 25. Oh, well, the woman starts. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. In other words, like, God, I'm not sure what you're on about, but we'll We'll understand one day. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. And the woman let, left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman said, he told me everything I ever did. When we dig a well, seldom is the purpose of that well to serve one person. If we all had to have our individual wells, uh, there'd be a lot of holes in the ground, right? That's not how the world works. That's not, not how wells work. And that's not really how investing in meaningful relationships work either. When we make one investment in a person, the ripple effect, the good, positive impact that can come, extends to many. One relationship can lead many others to come and see and hear about Jesus too. The conversation at the well didn't just transform the Samaritan woman. It rippled through her entire community. Her encounter with Jesus led her to share her experience, influencing those around her and inviting them to meet him for themselves. Her testimony drew her community to Jesus. An investment in a single person can extend to many, affecting families, workplaces, and neighborhoods. And Jesus actually talks with his disciples later on in the chapter, and he says, look at this harvest. It's ready. It's ripe. He encourages them to open their eyes to see the fields ripe for harvest. How are we looking at our community and identifying even those people in the community that can be having significant impact on other people? One person's testimony can change a village. And so we are called to be intentional in our efforts to connect, to invest in relationships that not only enrich our lives and the lives of those that we're engaging with, but have the potential to transform a community. Really, Jesus, um, to reach a Samaritan town, Jesus could have done many other things. In today's language, Jesus could have appeared on the local television channel to spread the message. He could have written a book and placed it in every bookstore in Samaria. He could have had a massive evangelical crusade in Samaria's capital city. But he didn't. He went out of his way to find this one woman and show her her greatest need. He came to her personally. Jesus is after her heart. Jesus is after your heart. Jesus was after her worship, and he's after your worship. He's after your joy. He loves you and wants to make you whole. So whether you're sitting here religious or an atheist, moral 
or immoral, an outcast or in, an insider. You need Jesus personally. And those around you need Jesus personally too. And so what can we do about this? I thought three quick, simple, maybe you can remember points. One, look up. Give thanks to God for those who have invested in you. We can often act as if the Bible can be best shared through big programs and events. We think it can be large-scale, automated, impersonal, uh, just a process that runs. But God always works personally, and He sends us to individual people to tell them about Jesus, just like someone came to tell you. Look up and give thanks to God today for the people that have invested in you and saw beyond the surface to reach you. Next, look in. Ask God to prompt your heart to who he might be leading you to invest in. Who is Jesus sending you to? The gospel isn't spread group by group. The gospel is spread person to person. Every person you see shares the same need for Jesus, the same need that you have for hope and salvation they have too. Jesus used this one conversation to change this woman's life. Then she went into town and started telling others, what might God do if we would each invest in the people around us personally? Last week, Jesse um, pointed you to this page that is sitting on your chair, and these five circles, which is the journey that we're on, and invited you on the back to think about who you could connect with. This week, I'm inviting you to think about who you could invest in. And then, I mean, words on this paper are great, okay? But that's not really where the challenge stops, and so the last one is probably the hardest for us, but what we call to do as well, and that's to look out. Reach out to someone who needs to hear Jesus' message of hope and salvation this week. Point them to Jesus, the living water. They thirsty. You were once thirsty. But Jesus, the living water, can satisfy. Jesus went to an everyday place, a well, and found a woman who needed him, and he told her the good news. Where's your well? Maybe you need to go to the break room at work, the kitchen, and talk with someone. Maybe you need to knock on the door of your neighbor that you've walked past a hundred times. Maybe you need to sit by someone as you are out and about this week, having a relationship. Maybe it's having a really meaningful conversation with your kids in the car. Who can you reach out to and invest in this week? Let me pray for us. Father God, how privileged we are to be in your house where you are present with us. Lord, this morning we just bring to mind, even in this very moment, thinking about the people who have invested in us. We think about the people who have uh, reached out to us, even though it may have been uncomfortable and awkward for them. But they approached us still and said, have you heard of Jesus Christ? Are you thirsty? Drink of the living water. Father God, thank you for using people around us, our families, our communities, our friends, preachers and lay people alike to, to invest in us and share the message of Jesus. And Father God, now in this moment, we also invite you to prompt our hearts by your Spirit. Bring to mind the name or names of people who we can invest in in this week. those who are searching and longing, those who have questions, those who are hurting, 
and need hope and salvation in this day. So Father God, we ask you to, by your spirit, fill us with courage, courage to send that WhatsApp message of encouragement, courage to make that phone call and invite someone for coffee, courage to knock on that door or our co-worker's desk and begin a conversation that points back to you. Jesus, we know that you don't call us to invest in relationship for relationship's sake. No, Lord, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Father God, would we be renewed with an excitement of coming to know you, just like the woman ran back to her village. Would we be eager to invite others and invest in them so that we can build the relationship that it takes to have those conversations? Father God, we love you. We thank you for the gift that Jesus is in our lives. And we pray that we would be good salt and light as we head out this week. May streams of living water flow in Pretoria East and even to the ends of earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that great word, Mike. Such a challenge. Such a challenge. Most of us sitting here, we are here. We know Jesus because someone chose to invest in us. Sure. Thanks, Mike, for that good word. Uh, Church, thank you so much for coming to church this morning. Um, It is an honor and a privilege to be able to worship with you. Um, Just before you go, I want to remind you of a few things. Don't forget to head over to the Abbas Pride table right over there if you have any questions around the Shorts or Youth Retreat and getting involved in that. If you are new, please don't forget about our guest area. We would love to connect with you and... Maybe we can invest, as Mike spoke about. Uh, Also, we have our Next Steps course starting today. Uh, It'll be starting at 11 o'clock, and it'll be in the ministry room. So right as you go out this door to your right, you'll see the doors open there. So Next Steps is starting today. And then lastly, if you need prayer, if you need someone to connect with, uh, the elders and the pastors will be here around the guest area. So if you need that or if you would like to just come over there, we are there to chat. Church, have a great Sunday. I hope it's filled with so much food at lunchtime. Cheers, everybody. Bye.